Hey everyone and welcome to the video version of the Funnily Enough Show podcast. This is where you get the raw, unedited version of the video calls that I do with all of the guests on the show. If you're more of an audio person then be sure to head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or your favourite podcasting platform where you can listen to it in your ear. But if you're more of a video person, you want to watch the live call, then it's coming right up now. Mike Morrison, welcome to the Funnily Enough Show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. A little, a little manic, a little chaotic as we prepare for our big event, but I'm looking forward to taking a break from that to uh, chat with you. Yeah, you're in the midst of getting Retain Live. I think we're, what, a week away at the time of recording this? So Yeah, yeah. in one week time, it'll be, um, we'll be setting everything up and then we've got registration and then it all, it all kicks off. Wow. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out to come on the show and to share your wisdom. So let's just get straight into it then, shall we? I want to ask a, a very serious question, which is, okay. like, who wears the trousers at the membership, guys? Let's be honest. Oh, 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 oh. I think over the, the time we've worked together, we've kind of perfected the art of, of making me feel like I'm wearing the trousers a little bit more than I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in everyone kind of knowing that Kali is the real power behind the power couple. Um, honestly, though, it's a, it's a nice balance. You know, there's, we bring different things to the table in, in terms of um, what we can do to the business, how we contribute. And um, that means, you know, if it's a Mike thing, Mike's got the trousers on. If it's a Cali thing, Cali's got the trousers on. If it's a Mike or Cali thing, Cali's got the trousers on. <laughs> I like it. So Cali, what we're saying is Cali's got wears the trousers, but she makes you think that you're yeah. wearing trousers. I think yeah, that's- part part of her role in the business is just to inflate my ego a little bit. So <laughs> so I don't realize just how unnecessary I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's dive into that a little bit then. So you, you two obviously run the business yourselves uh, and predominantly from home, I believe. So how do you manage that? I think we were speaking once to Social Media Marketing World and you say that you have separate office, offices. Um, but I know when some people work together that they can, like it can affect their relationship almost. How, how do you two manage working from home and on the business? Honestly, the separate offices thing is, um, we usually say it as kind of a jokey thing, but we do. And as... Uh, as time's gone on and um, you know, we've been able to kind of have larger spaces we're living in, we make a point of trying to get as far away from each other within the, the house as possible. And that is, that is just so we, we aren't under each other's feet all the time because you know, days will pass where we have no reason to leave the house. Like our work day, our personal life is within these four walls and under this roof. And if you don't approach it correctly, it can be stifling. And we know that because in the very early days, before we officially started working together, we were each running our own businesses and we were living in a very small place. Like this place was a converted garage, right? It was um, a, a double width garage that someone had converted into a summer house that we happened to be living in. So we were, we were like inches apart from each other, um, crowned on the sofa, every single day working and um, that wasn't a good arrangement. It wasn't a good working environment. So um, yeah, that, that's why we've had the separate um, working spaces. Uh, we also do little things like we, we try unless, unless it's a time like now where we've got so much going on that we're working longer hours and stuff. We, we generally always knock off work at, at a normal time. Kali tends to, to knock off five or six. I tend to knock off four or five because I'm lazier. Um, and so we have, even though we work from home, we've run our own businesses for years, we still have a quite a conventional nine to five-ish work life. And we, we try not to take it home. Like we, we don't work from, from the living room, for example. Like, so we don't just pull out the laptop and start working um, in an evening. Like it's a no work zone. So just little things like this, help but you know i've been working together in in the business for gosh around five or six years now and when we first got together as a couple which happened first we were running our own businesses too so we've been 
um, like self-employed working from home for even longer than that. So we've kind of perfected it a bit, I think. That's not to say that it doesn't still bleed over. Like we'll we'll go out for dinner and we'll spend the whole time talking about work. But it's we, we love it. Like we we live it, and we've been fortunate enough to to create a business that is essentially a, a lifestyle business, just a very successful one. And so it's not it's it's not as much an issue when the business bleeds into the lifestyle because they they're intertwined. Yeah, and I think this is something that comes up quite a lot, especially when I speak to people that don't run their own businesses where mm. they say you work too long or why are you working? And it's like, well, because I love what I do. Like it's it's like a hobby. So yeah. I would quite like to dive into the business then that, that you that you have. And I'd quite like to dive into those early days because um I've set up a membership this year. I'm a part of your membership, which is amazing. Thank and you. anyone that's listening, if uh you're thinking about setting up a membership or you have one, then definitely check them out because I want to, I want to go back to like when you first decided that you wanted a membership site Mm -hmm. and um, I know you were operating as a, an agency before. What was the, what were those first, not, not necessarily the trigger point and what caused you to want a membership site, but that like first month of the membership, first two, three months or the kind of two, three months that you had leading up to when you initially launched, what, what did they look like? Were, were you just tired of clients? Did you <laughs> want a membership site? What, what was the kind of um, catalyst? To, to yeah, the, there were a few, there were a few elements of that. And it's funny, we just did a live um, member Q and A call last night and someone asked us about those earlier days. It's been a while since we've, since we've mentally revisited them. Um, and we found ourselves kind of, we just went on a tear for about 30 minutes, just like talking about it and reminiscing. It was, it was an interesting time because we'd, we'd actually hit a place where we were enjoying a really successful run with, with working with clients. We'd, um, we'd really gelled in, in our partnership together. We'd kind of refined our, our marketing and our sales process so that the clients we were bringing in were nine times out of 10, just a, an absolute joy to work with. There were no late pairs. There were no major pain in the backsides. There were a few, but they were rare. Um, so a lot, of the, a lot of the headaches and hassles of, of working with clients and running an agency, we'd eliminated them. And so there was that, there was that element when the discussion about, okay, like, should we move into running our own membership? There was that element of not wanting to ruin a good thing. And the, the idea, not so much the idea, because this is what we were doing anyway, we were specialized with memberships, but the, the added motivation to create a membership just came from how many people we were having to, uh, to, to turn away, who wanted advice from us, who couldn't, they w just weren't in a, a position, whether it was financially or just, how far along they were with their idea. They just weren't in a position to hire us um, to, to help them one-on-one. -on -one. And even if they were, we were at capacity. We just couldn't take on any more clients without um, running ourselves into the ground or expanding even further with new team members and stuff. So it, it was demand. People, people kept asking us. And originally, we, just, we were really just trying to find somewhere to send these people to. So we want, we hate saying, no, we can't help you. You're on your own tough luck, especially because what we do is, is so niche. So we, we set out to actually find somewhere to send these people. Like there's, there's got to be a membership about memberships where we can say, okay, we can't help you, but actually go and join this membership, go and take this course or whatever. And there was nothing that we would put our stamp of approval on. It was all really outdated, sleazy, internet marketing 90s rubbish that we just didn't feel good sending people to so we had that conversation okay well do we just do we just live with the fact you can't help everyone um it's not our responsibility to help everybody um so tough that's just how it is or do we do something about it and we love memberships the reason we were specializing in them as an agency is because we love every aspect of them. And so 
those conversations got more serious and and we made that decision that we were going to start that membership and um we moved quite i was going to say we moved quite quickly we actually moved quite slowly after that because uh, i remember it was probably about 11 months after we we decide this is something we are going to do before we open the doors to the membership because we had such a client load on that we just knew we wouldn't have any breathing room for it mm. so we we set up a facebook group um and we um we kind of just all those people who were like can you help us we just sent them there and we just started paying just listening to them just engaging with them starting to get more into that 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 area where we were having conversations with a larger group of people day to day about memberships and just getting that deeper understanding of the the broader range of problems and questions that were out there in the world you know in, in a an audience where people were trying to do this themselves rather than paying people like us to help them um and so we we i think didn't really change anything for about six months um during that time the activity in the group the demand the way the group was growing told us that it was a safe bet to start making this move so i think it was july 2015 we um we went all in the membership guys as a brand was born the blog start the podcast started the youtube video um strategy that was meant to start um got started but it just fizzled out like a few months later um because it was too much and then three months after that we we launched the academy uh but yeah we were still juggling client work which was a bit of a transition i was gonna um, ask so did yeah. you did you do them both at the same time or was it like it, cut off the clients and and so um, how did you phase that out yeah there was there was an overlap and uh we because we knew it was coming we initially started kind of phasing out the i hate to say lower quality but kind of lower quality projects essentially yeah. the, the ones where the clients were a little bit more of a headache where um you know the 10 there were 10 hour long jobs that would turn into 30 hours because of constantly having to chase clients and stuff like that so we started we started phasing those out we didn't have too many of them but we we started turning any jobs away that we had a little bit of a a, a good feeling were going to be a pain in our butt because you know those can drag on and drag on um we knew we had a, a few kind of top end clients who we were really heavily entrenched in their business we knew that that would be a much longer process so um we let them know what we were doing because obviously um you know we didn't want them seeing that we're blogging and podcasting and thinking oh you know does this mean that i'm gonna to have to start finding someone to replace them so we'll let them know what we, they were doing and we discussed kind of a, a transition period and a timeline with them um and then just gradually as as we started we stopped taking on new clients we started wrapping up projects we'd been working on and that kind of coincided with the membership growing as well to to replace that that lost revenue nice. and we were fortunate it was quite smooth as well um and it happened faster than we thought it would so the the risk paid off because if if the membership took longer to find its feet than the projects took to to finish off we would have had a, a three to six month period in which you know we'd be living on super noodles <laughs> i was going to ask that was there was there a moment that you had to take a there was a revenue drop because when you're working with clients you're obviously like yeah thousands of pounds per client yeah. and membership there wasn't there wasn't really a membership uh, a revenue drop there was a, a brown trousers moment <laughs> right at the start because we'd set ourselves we set ourselves a deadline um, when we said about we stopped taking on new jobs. At the time, we still had a handful of projects that we'd we'd signed off. They'd paid a deposit because we always used to take fifty percent deposit up front. They'd paid their deposit, but they hadn't yet got their act together and all the materials and all the stuff for us to actually get started on the project. So as we were coming up to this deadline where we said no more new projects past this date we're looking at this slate of unstarted projects thinking like we've got no idea when this is going to happen some of them it had been three months since we got their deposit and they they just still hadn't got their act together 
And so we knew that it would, would hold us back. You know, the reason we weren't taking on new jobs is because we knew we, we had to give that time to, to the membership. So um, when that date came, we had to cancel those jobs. Mm. And that meant we had to hand back deposits. And um, those totaled about 50 grand. Ooh. And at that stage, and at any stage, 50 grand is not a small amount. <laughs> um, and that was at a point where it was still relatively early days for the membership. We were only a few months in and uh, yeah, wow. it, it was, it was probably the biggest um, risk that I think we've, we've taken that's pure financial, uh, but it paid off. Brilliant. I'm thankfully. Sure. thankfully. <laughs> yeah, it sure has. So, when if somebody is thinking about a membership site well it's like it sounds like the you the brand that you had and the audience that you kind of had from the agency kind of helped you feed into that and give you maybe a kickstart to that said membership. we actually no we actually when you mentioned the audience i would think the running the agency and actually for for so long specializing just on memberships because there was there was a a long period where actually we just niche totally down in only work with membership companies that that really helped us with the validation side we knew that there there was a high enough interest in the membership space the facebook group helped us to refine that validation a little bit more because it told us not only was an interest in the membership space but there was enough people who were interested in doing this themselves as opposed to just want to pay others to do it for them Mm. but we didn't have much of an audience almost all of our work in the agency was word of mouth and referral. Like, and, and that had actually kind of been the cornerstone of, of, of our, our separate careers when we were um, like running our own one man band businesses previously. Like we met through a, a business networking membership. Like we, we networked, we, we got our business through referral, through word of mouth, um, as opposed to online like lead generation and, and relying on search traffic or content marketing and stuff like that. We did bits of that, but that's not where the work came from. So when we, when we brought the membership guys brand, we didn't have, I think we maybe had maybe 50 people on our email list total because right. we just weren't doing lead gen. Yeah. And those people, like if you actually nab them down to people with a, a membership in, uh, sorry, an interest in memberships, they had the interest in it, but, their their interest was to pay someone to do it for them. That's not our market. Yep. Um, you know, we explicitly do not ever want to create a membership for someone ever again. And so they were the wrong people. So we actually emailed them and kind of said, okay, this is what we're going to be doing. And this is the transition we're making. If you're interested in following, following along, let us know and we'll make sure you're subscribed. But otherwise... <laughs> Otherwise, goodbye. You know, we we canned most of that audience because it wasn't who it wasn't who we were catering to. Um, so we almost start from scratch on the audience building side of things. And again, that was that was a little bit of a scary thing. Not be you know, it's not like we had to delete an email list of like ten thousand people, but to 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 realize that this marketing channel, this source of of work that has sustained us and got us to this point is not in any way going to be useful for this new path that we're taking. You're not going to go to a business networking meeting, a, a BNI meeting or a 4N meeting, uh, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning and tout your, your membership for membership <laughs> people. It's too specific and it's too small a group of people to go to. So that, that was a bit of a, um, an interesting switch as well, but, Obviously, that's when we put into play the strategies that we spent years telling everybody else to do with their membership. Okay, this is, re- this is really interesting then because I want to dive into that kind of growth strategy then to get you from those initial early days with no audience mm-hmm. to obviously where you are now. But before we do that, I'm going to interrupt proceedings because it's time for a game. Oh, no. The five-second <laughs> rule. Have you ever heard of it before? Uh, I've heard of it. Okay. But never played it? I don't think I've ever played it on a podcast. Okay, so the, the rules are simple. I'm going to read out, I've got 10 cards here. I'm going to read out 10 statements, each of which have, well, a statement on it. And you have five seconds after I read that statement to give me an answer. So it might be something like three types of ice cream 
and you've got five seconds to go. Vanilla, strawberry, chocolate. Okay. First question, which isn't actually a, a scoring question, is do you want to go red or yellow? Yellow is slightly harder. Uh, red. Let's go red. Not because of the difficulty, but because I'm a, I'm a Man United fan, which is traitorous here in Newcastle. But <laughs> Well, red it is. You ready, Mike? Go for it. Name three types of illnesses. Um, cancer, AIDS, influenza. Well, starting strong. Starting, starting like going for the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Name three high street retailers. Uh, next, Boots Sports Direct. Nice, solid start. Name three things that you can buy in a newsagent's. Uh, magazine, fruit pastels, bottle of water. Nice fruit pastels. Wow, I've not. <laughs> Uh, they st- do they still exist? They do. Wow. They do. Oh, yeah. Name three modes of transport. Car, bus, train. Lovely. Name three green things. The color green. Uh, grass, grape, green fruit pastel. <laughs> yes. Name three things not to do in a job interview. Um, fart, hit someone, run out screaming. <laughs> You're solid, Mike. <laughs> Name three things beginning with the letter J. J. Um, job. Uh, oh, Time no, man. You've totally thrown me on that one. Oh, that's a tough one. It is. I think you're going to get this one. Name three heroes in films. Um, Captain America, Wolverine, and Iron Man. Nice. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get that one. Name three planets. Uh, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus. Lovely. And name three things that go with chips. Uh, fish, peas, pie. Lovely. All at the same time. That was, I feel like that's the quickest five second rule we've ever played. Awesome. Awesome. And you got nine out of 10. Yeah, that J1 threw me a bit. I'm like looking around my filming room now and I, there was literally nothing in here that begins with J. So I think I was at a disadvantage. Name three things that begin with J. Like a uh, jumper. Jock strap, um, jungle, j- yeah, jam. <laughs> you obviously don't have, you not got toast and jam for your lunch today. No, no. <laughs> Amazing. Well, like we said before, before the game, let's let's dive into that growth strategy then, mm-hmm. because um, currently where I'm at in the membership is, we, I think we launched about four months ago, um, and we're sitting at about seventy members, which cool. I'm pretty happy with. Yeah, should um, be. And I've seen memberships where people have more numbers than that, memberships where people have less numbers than that. So what, what did your growth look like? And what was the, and let's, let's go for like the first three months. So for the mm-hmm. people that are listening that are maybe in a position now where they're working with clients or maybe they're not working with clients, but they're thinking about a membership. What's that first three months? What did growth look like for you? And what, what was the kind of main driver of that growth? Um, we launched, I think we, we, Ended our launch with like maybe about 85 um, member signups. And that was, that was on the back of essentially a three-month uh, a three month lead-in from when we launched the, the podcast. And we started actually marketing the brand to actually opening the doors of the, the membership. Um, that launch was fueled by a 30-day challenge that we did. Uh, where it was basically build your membership in 30 days, step-by-step step with an email every single day. I think we've got 300 people subscribed to that. And from, from those guys, we, uh, we launched about 85. And um, I think it, that went up to maybe about 120, 130 by the three-month mark, mm. um, which you know we, was more than we actually expected. I think we were expecting about 50, just taking into consideration the size of our audience and the, the short lead-in time for um, for just like going from nothing to launching. Um, so it, it moved a little bit quicker. I think around about that Christmas time, we were closer about 200. Right. And then um, I think we've gone up by maybe 200 odd the next year and four or 500 the year after. And yeah, it's, I lose track of this stuff, but I do remember it being around about 85 when we launched. Great. And what, what, so you did the 30 day challenge and then after that, so the 80 to the hundred, the hundred to 200 to 400 mark, what was the kind of main drivers there? I know you're content marketing, yeah. predominantly content marketing. Um, in particular, our podcast, 
like we, when we launched the podcast, we obviously, we, we knew it was a good way of reaching people. And, you know, we know that it's, it's a way in which you can build trust within your audience in a way that you can't with written content, simply because I think being able to hear someone's voice makes you feel connected to them. So we launched it for the right, uh, right reasons. It was part of our marketing for the right reasons. But honestly, a big, big part of the reason we launched it is um, as a vanity project for me because I uh, love the sound of my own voice. I uh, co-founded an internet radio station like back in 2005, and I was missing sitting in front of a mic just talking rubbish. Um, so because of that, we never expected it to be as big a part uh, or as big a driving force in, in our success as it turned out to be. But during our launch, obviously, when people were signing up, we surveyed them. You know, We asked, where did you find out about us? And I would say probably about one in three said the podcast. Wow. And that, that blew us away that early in the game as well. I think at that stage, we'd maybe put out 15 to 20 episodes. So it was, it was very early on. The quality was garbage because it was the very beginning. Um, I hadn't really found my feet with podcasting. But yeah, one in three people found us through the podcast and the the biggest revelation was actually these were people who I don't think we would have reached at all otherwise. Um, there was a lot of people throughout Europe and the U S who um, we knew just weren't like, they weren't on Facebook group. They weren't engaging with us in other ways. They wouldn't have found us. I don't think mm. in the, in the podcast. So content marketing was definitely a, a, a huge, huge part of that early growth and things really accelerated when we just got a little bit, um, a little bit smarter with that, a little, da- little bit down the road, and we started segmenting our lead gen a bit more um, than we had been doing, and yeah, like I think that's pretty much remained the main thing ever since. So, just just to, as a wrap up question, then with the podcast, mm. what what type of content were you creating, or are you creating on the podcast that specifically? drives people to because one in three people signing up is a a massive like a huge number so what content are you creating specifically there that is pushing people to actually take that action we were answering questions and actually you know what i wish i'd written the book before marcus sheridan got it out there because we were doing that that was our entire strategy was predicated on apple's um on the whole there's an app for that thing that was associated with Apple, right? You've got a problem, there's an app for that. We wanted it to be a case of, okay, you've got a problem, you've got a question with the membership, there's a podcast episode for that. That approach, coupled with the way we were using the Facebook group, because we were literally going into the Facebook group, it was earlier days, so it was small, it was more reasonable for us to be personally involved. Someone would ask a question, I would literally go away and record an answer as a podcast and then go back and say, Funnily enough, <laughs> what a coincidence. I'm actually going to be releasing a podcast episode next week that addresses that question. For now, though, this is the answer, but make sure you stay tuned for the podcast next week. That was the strategy then. That's the strategy now. The, the whole approach is for every single episode of the podcast to be the answer to a question someone is, is having. That extends to our blog, um, and that's why you know, like so much of what we do revolves around just listening to what our audience are saying and making sure we're answering those questions and it's paying off now because we're not we're not really involved in our free facebook group um on a day-to-day basis it's up to about thirteen thousand now so the community kind of support themselves in there but we see when people are asking questions other people in the group they're sharing the podcast that we've done that answers that question so the whole they ask we answer um approach that that's been a since day one uh, a cornerstone of, of what we do and um you know it's Lovely. real real simple and i think people overcomplicate that too much yeah it's just so simple yet so effective answer the questions that yeah we're asking you amazing yeah it's like like when you when you think when people are trying to figure out okay like <sighs> should I use an H1 tag or an H2 tag or an H3 tag to, to best cater towards Google search? But they're not thinking about what 
the entire notion of a search is. People search for stuff when they are seeking an answer. So that's what you need to be in the business of doing. You need to be in the business of solving problems, answering questions. That's it. That's the only reason we're all here is to solve problems and answer questions. So, yeah. There we go. I'm going to underline that. <laughs> if you're listening, I don't know. What, is that an analogy? Or, I don't know. Yeah, just, just tell, you, yeah, tell your editor to just turn that bit up. <laughs> like, slow it down or put some fancy effect around it or something. <laughs> Amazing. Mike, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for spending this time giving away so much wisdom and sharing that journey because I think one of the most valuable things when you do something like go into a new industry like building a membership site or launching a course whatever it be is mm-hmm. is hearing someone else's story on how they went from uh, starting from nothing to, to building something great yeah and honestly i think there's so much especially in the online business world where you know people will will do an income report if they find a, a pound note on the street like there's so much bragging so much about the headline money being made and this that and the other that um, it can be easy to be dissuaded if it's taking a little longer or, you know, if you're thinking that's just not achievable. But this is why I love memberships. Memberships are about the long game. You know, it's one step at a time, one member at a time. And, uh, yeah, it's great. That's the way we built it. That's the way our members are building it. And that's the way, that's the way to go. Love it. Mike, tell everyone where they can find you uh, and uh, what you're up to. Yeah, if you head over to themembershipguys.com, that's where you'll find all sorts of resources, links to our podcast, links to our membership about memberships and everything else that we're doing. And uh, yeah, if you want our help more directly, it's membershipacademy.com. That's where we do our best stuff. That's where we hang out every single day with our members. And I'm a member of that as well. And I can put my seal of approval on it. It's, it's amazing. Awesome. And um, yeah, I love it. So thank you. thank you so much, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey everyone, me again. And thank you so much for watching the video version of the podcast. I hope you found that very useful and valuable and entertaining. I hope it brought a smile to your face. Now, if you'd like to listen to more of the shows then head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or your favorite podcasting platform and you can check that out. And if you'd like to see the show notes from this week's show, head over to mrgavinbell.com forward slash podcast to get that goodness.